has to do with up and down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know about Saturday morning.
Everybody's fingertips warmed up. Yeah. Everybody feeling sharp? You got all the chord progressions? Huh? two mics in the house that work, yeah. the mic that you have and the mic that Michael has. Okay. So when you're I'll, done, I'll give it you, to you give your mic. Yeah, you can just run through it and we'll, we'll get going quick before we get. Right. Good morning, First Bible Church. If you will stand with me and open up in your big blue hymnal to page 175. Page 175, standing on the promises of God. Page 175. Find a seat, any seat, grab your hymnal, and let's sing it like we mean it this morning. Amen? Page 175, standing on the promises. <clears throat> on the first now. On the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Second now, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall
Father, we will open us up in a word of prayer this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just uh, I thank you I could be here this morning, Amen. Father, and just hear from your word and sing your praises, Lord. And Father, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand, Lord. And I just thank you I could be here, Father. I pray you meet with us, Lord. I just pray you draw our attention to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Father. And Lord, I just pray I can get my heart right here this morning, Lord. And I just thank you and love you that you died for me, Lord. You're the reason that we're here, Lord. And I just pray we can remember that this morning, Lord, and just thank you for this church, Lord, the heritage we have, Lord, and I just love you, Lord, and just pray you conform us to the image of your son, Lord, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. You know, I was reading this morning, uh, I've, been, I've been thinking about a, uh, the thought of a merry heart in the Bible, a merry heart, and I was reading this morning. You know, there are verses like in Proverbs 15, 13, it says, A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, right? But sorrow of the heart, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken, right? So sorrow of the heart, you have a broken spirit. Sorrow of the heart, the Bible tells you, you have uh, dry bones in Proverbs 17, 22, right? A merry heart doeth good like medicine, but a, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. And sometimes we can get down that way, you know? We can get down, we can get dry, it could be the weather, it could just be... Uh, uh, a, a chapter in life, perhaps, that we're going through. But you know what the, uh, the cure is for that? It's a merry heart. And you know how you get a merry heart? I was reading it this morning in Second Chronicles uh, chapter 7. Uh, Solomon uh, is de dedicating the temple, and then Solomon prays a big, long prayer, all of chapter 6. And then uh, in verse 10 of Second uh, Chronicles chapter 7, the Bible says, uh, uh, and the three and twentieth day of the seventh month, he sent the people away. Solomon sent the people away into their tents, glad and merry in heart for the goodness that the Lord had showed unto David and to Solomon and to Israel, his people. For the goodness that the Lord had shown. You want a merry heart this morning? You want a merry heart? Think about the goodness of God. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, page 272, the solid rock. Page 272. Oh, 
Page 209, Grace Greater Than Our Sin, page 209. Page 49, Our Great Savior. We'll do one more before Pastor comes. Page 49.
Yes. Is he okay? This is good. Testing, testing, testing. see you this morning. Praise the Lord. And uh, it's good to have uh, George back in church with us again, in and out of the hospital and uh, doing well enough to be able to be here today. So George, good to see you. All right, some uh, quick announcements just to uh, remind you about some things going on today. Of course, um, those of you that are signed up and paid, there's an activity today at three o'clock. We won't give you the details. Here are, I think we're leaving here at three o'clock, right? All right, so you need to be here before 3 o'clock if you're involved in that activity, if you've signed up and paid for that this afternoon. Be here so we can uh, get in the vans and get rolling by 3 this afternoon. Uh, also, uh, this evening at 8 o'clock, um, if you're able to be there, the uh, funeral service for Christian Patterson is going to be at the, um, I forget the name, is that Scarpacci? Scarpacci Funeral Home right around the corner. Uh, at 8 o'clock this evening, uh, his dad... Uh, Nick Patterson is going to be bringing the message. I think uh, Giacomo is providing some of the music. Are you playing there tonight, brother, I think? And um, so uh, the Patterson family used to be a part of our church for many years before they moved away to Pennsylvania. And uh, Christian, when he was a young, ma young man, was uh, in our Christian Academy here. But he uh, passed away just a few days ago. So if you'd like to be there and just be a blessing to the family, that's at 8 o'clock tonight. Uh, viewing starts at 7 or this afternoon from 2 to 4 as well, if you're able to go. Uh, also, today's the last day for the early bird discounted price for our youth camp this summer. Harvest Bound Youth Camp is from the uh, 17th to the 23rd of July. Uh, the price is normally 120 but uh, if you can get it in, uh, get your registration taken care of today with Bob, uh, we're sending a check off today or tomorrow. Uh, and it's just $99, so you save a little bit of money if you can do that right away. All right, so you could see Brother Bob 
today uh, before you leave uh, the building. Also, tomorrow morning, weather permitting, um, we're going to be pouring uh, what might be the last of our concrete. <laughs> we're, we've been putting a concrete apron around the uh, courtyard area out there, and we have the last two small little sections to, to do tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Um, but we really need some commitments from a few guys, that if you could be there and just help us. Our job is just to uh, wheel the wheelbarrows with the concrete in it over to the little areas that we're going to fill in. Um, and I probably need four guys. Is, is anyone here this morning that you know you could be here tomorrow at, um, by 8 o'clock, a few minutes early if possible? Anybody at all be able to do that? Vinny? Nick? Okay. And then I'll be there. And Tom, thank you. Uh, I know Brother Pat's going to be there and Bob. All right, that should, uh, should be able to do it. That'll put Larry's mind at rest. All right, okay, you, all right, you good? Okay, that's six guys. We'll be fine. All right, tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, come a little early. I think the truck arrives at 8, so we've got to be ready to go at 8 o'clock. Shouldn't take long. It's two small sections, and we'll be, should be out of here within a short period of time. Thank you for that. Uh, and then Saturday, this coming Saturday, is the memorial service for Brother Ed Lacaro. And uh, so please be here. We're going to start that at 11 o'clock. Um, I think the family has put together some pictures and video memories. And uh, he's been a big part of our church uh, from the very beginning, from the very start. Uh, you're sitting in a building right now that once belonged to Eddie. We bought it from him years ago when our church began here. And, uh, and he's just an important part of everything here. So uh, we'd like to honor his memory on Saturday and also just lift up the Lord Jesus Christ as well. So uh, please keep that in mind. Pray it up and, and just mark it on your calendar so you can be here this coming Saturday at 11 o'clock. And then the only other thing to mention is our missions conference uh, coming up in just two weeks from today. Uh, starts on June the 26th through Friday, uh, the 1st of July. Uh, as we've said many times, several of our missionary families are going to be here. Uh, the St. Arnauds, uh, John and Karen Castilla, and um, Corey Riggs from Poland. Uh, he can't bring his whole family, but he's bringing his uh, oldest daughter. They're coming for a portion. They can't stay for the whole week, but he'll be per part of the week. And then we also are hoping to get uh, video conference calls with uh, the rest of our missionaries who are just going to say a few words to the church during that week. So uh, please pray that up. Obviously, it's just an emphasis in one week on the, uh, the ministry of missions. It's a big part of everything we do here. Uh, it's uh, way more than half of our budget is spent on getting the gospel out, and, um, and that's the way it should be. Um, I know a good church that we hold in high esteem, and about 85% of their budget is spent on missions. And for most churches, it's 10 or 20% usually is a max, but um, it's always been, a, been an important issue to us, an important part of our ministry, and so we want to just put the emphasis on it that week and just remind everybody about what's going on. All right, um, hmm, I think that's it. Anything else you know I need to mention? Okay, let's uh, just take a moment and uh, just uh, have a word of prayer together as a church family today. Are you glad you're here this morning? Amen. Praise the Lord. It's a great place to be, right? Amen. And uh, just pray for yourself. Pray for you that the Lord would just speak to your heart, and open, your, open your, your mind and your eyes to the truth of God's Word today. Um, every one of us have different needs today. But, of course, God knows you extremely well, knows what you need, and can minister to you today. And he wants to, but we have to be able to receive it, prepared to receive it. So pray that you will be today. All right? Let's bow our heads together. Father, Lord God, we do thank you once again for the privilege that we have to be together today. What a blessing it is, Lord, to be a part of this church family. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and kindness to us, Lord, to for just holding this thing together all these years and allowing us, Lord, as we come to the closing uh, months or years of this church age, Lord, for First Bible Church to still be here, to be a witness and a testimony in this place. We pray that you'd help us right up until the very last day, that day that you come for us, Lord. I pray that our testimony would be clear and our doctrine would be sound and our people would be a good testimony for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would knit us together in love and uh, meet the needs of your people this morning, Lord. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you, Lord, that we have an infallible, uh, infallible uh, final authority that the King James Bible 
is pure and true and preserved, and uh, Lord, we have never sought to correct it in any way. We know it's perfect, and we pray this morning, Lord, that the power of your word would be evident in this place today. Bless Pastor Dean as he preaches. Use him today. Speak to our hearts and accomplish your will in this place, Lord. Equip us even again today, Lord, to be good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ and help us and remind us today, Lord, that in every area of life, in every single situation, Christ is all. May you be lifted up. May your name be magnified today, Lord. May you draw us closer to you and knit us closer to one another in love. Thank you for these things. Thank you for our musicians and Sunday school teachers and our deacons and all, the, all those that are laboring, many behind the scenes in the sound room and other places just to make things go well and to be a good testimony for you. And we pray you'll bless them today, Lord. May you get all the glory. We love you and thank you and ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. their lives to count for something to leave their mark when life is through but vain pursuits will count for nothing time will erase what we do Count for Jesus, for earthly things will quickly fade. No need to add to earthly riches. I only seek eternal gain inside my heart. There burns a question What was I placed on earth here for? It truly was to build a kingdom Not of my own, but of the Lord's I want my life to count for Jesus, for earthly things will quickly fade. No need to add to earthly riches. I only seek eternal gain. Take my life and let it be consecrated Lord to me I want my life to count for Jesus for earthly things will quickly fade no need to add to earthly riches, I only seek eternal gain. Ooh, you can quickly and quietly be dismissed. And if you will, grab your chorus book and open up to page 68. Page 68. Give ear into Micah 6 8.
Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto Thee will I pray, my voice shalt Thou hear in the morning, O Lord. you need a Bible this morning, uh, we have both of our guys working the aisles today. I want you to be able to follow along. John chapter 6. John the Gospel of John, chapter, uh, excuse me, I gave you the wrong address. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. I'm, I'm going to, the Lord willing, review a little bit of material that I taught it's been some time ago, but I want to add to it this morning. There's, uh, you know how you get stuck sometimes when you're reading? Well, I've gotten, I, I, I've gotten stuck in uh, John chapter 11 and looking at uh, a funeral. Funerals are never pleasant, even when you know that that person who is past is in the presence of the Lord. 
funerals are never, as I said downstairs, and we've all heard this comment that uh, there's always an empty chair. I remember my mother always made, and I understand what Christmas is and what Christmas is not, but mom made Christmas. And when she passed away in 1988, I had the privilege of preaching her funeral and dad's and my mother-in-law's. But when mom passed, Christmas was never the same in the Dean house. Uh, we had our gift exchange and Deb and I lived here and we'd go back to Ohio to see mom and dad on both sides. But uh, once mom, Dean, had passed, uh, it, it, uh, the empty chair was never the same. And uh, I want you to go to uh, John chapter 11. The book of John is, is, is an amazing book because I think I counted it up and I don't know where I wrote it down. I counted 97 times in the book of John, some form of the word believe is found. Believe, believe est, believe errs, uh, 97 times in that one book. So the book of John is, uh, is a book of belief, all right? The whole Bible is a book of belief. But uh, we're going to read something, John chapter 11, and I just want to begin, I actually want to read the first 15 verses, but before we read those verses, begin with a word of prayer. So if we could just bow our heads and, and uh, let me pray, all right? Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. You've, we've sung about you congregationally and specials. And, and Lord, I pray that we, our fellowship has been that around the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, you've asked us to come and dine. You, you've given us, uh, us that invitation. And I'm fully aware, Father, that uh, there's never a time that I open your book that you don't want to speak to me. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would order our steps and make us that plain path. And Lord, give us... Uh, Open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Thank you, Father, for this invitation. Father, this morning, I just want to let heaven know again. I want to thank you for your love. Amen. I want to thank you for your goodness. I'm just not grateful. I want to say thank you. Lord, I want to thank you for 50 plus years of knowing you personally. I do not believe I've even touched the hem of your garment. But, oh, Father, I want to. And in this room today, I'm, I'm going to do what you have called me to do. But you must do the saving. You must redeem lives. One man plants and other waters, but God gives the increase. Father, may we always say this, and it, it is true. We know what's coming next most of the time in our church services. And it can get a little mechanical, Father. Deliver us this day from the mechanics of Christianity, of Christendom. And may we see Jesus Christ again afresh. Lord, I'm aware that even though I need to write things down on a page because of a scattered brain, I'm aware that notes on a page do not a message make. You must take what you gave me, and you must give it to your people. And I will say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John chapter 11, starting with verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and his sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother, brother Lazarus was sick. 
Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, it's a very, if you do not have God's perspective, you must read your Bible enough to get God's perspective because Jesus does something here that we don't like. Humanly, I don't agree with this. We have a tendency to jump on things immediately. And, and rightly so, nothing wrong with that. But Jesus didn't do that here. When he heard, therefore, in six that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, he say, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, are, are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, don't you love it? I just love it when Jesus is plain. When, you know, the parables are, I mean, I got it all, but it's just like when he didn't want somebody to understand something, he would, because of their bad heart attitude, he would, he would speak in parables. I love it when Jesus says something, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's plain. You know what your Bible is? Don't let anybody cheat you. You can under, by the, by the power of the Spirit of God, you, you, you can understand this King James Bible, 6th and 7th grade English. Don't let anybody tell you, well, you just can't understand the Bible. Well, I don't have a high, all I've got is a high school education, but I know how to read. Been born again for 50 some years. Been reading this book, tried to be, read it faithfully. And you know what the Spirit of God will do for you with the right heart attitude? He'll open up this book to you. He'll change your life. He'll, 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 he'll reveal every secret there is to be known. So don't let somebody cheat you out of your Bible. Don't let some PhD post hole digger <laughs> cheat you out of your Bible. Now, I've already gotten a rabbit trail, and I've got to get back. 14, then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. 15, and I am glad. Oh, my God, I'm sorry I shouldn't say, but how could he possibly say that? Because he was God, and he knew exactly what he was doing. He let a man die. He let a man stay stinky for four days and then brought him back to life. And you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 20, you know the first time the, the word life appears is on the fifth day. All right. You see, if you just read your Bible, there's amazing truths that you can get. All right. He said in 15, and I am glad for your sakes, Notice it's for your sake. Do you know Jesus does everything for your sake? My sake? To me, that's the heart of Christianity. Always looking out for somebody else's sake. Putting little to no value on your own life. We're so stinking selfish, most of us. It's our four and no more. That's not Christianity. That's not Jesus Christ. 
For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So the next time you read your Bible, always look for that little phrase, for your sakes. For your sakes. It appears multiple times all the way. Because that's the heart of your God. Now, if I'm being conformed, my brother prayed it. If I'm being conformed to the image of Christ's Son, uh, the image of God's Son, Jesus Christ, then that's part of the conforming process. I've got to stop being selfish. I've got to stop thinking, well, how about me? No, how about you? Spend, Paul would write in Corinthians, spend and be spent. Do you know why some of us really don't have joy and it's got nothing to do with always having a smile because I'm still, I can't get the smile on my face all the time. I think it's a muscular problem. I know some of you think it's a heart problem. No, it's, it's more of a muscular problem. Spend and be spent. Why some of us are not happy? Because we're following the God of Narcissus. The God Narcissus, who looked into the pool of water and saw such a beautiful reflection, and he loved what he saw. And we get our word, narcissism. Don't fall in love with yourself. Fall in love with Jesus Christ. By the grace of God, and I get, to, I get to work with my beloved pastor. This whole thing is love. You know what the ministry is? Come on. the mini- I love this building. Honest to God, I do. This is not Christianity. This is drywall. That basketball court, hey, we're going to pour some more concrete, God willing, tomorrow. But guess what? That concrete's not Christianity. Christianity boils down to two things, love God and love people. That's the long and the short of it. So whatever you young men are thinking about the ministry, come back Wednesday night, you'll learn more about the ministry. I went to those Bible college like my brother. I didn't learn the ministry there. You know why God put Deborah K. Dean and Pat Dean there? Because we had to learn as a married couple to trust God. Because we ran out of money. We ran out of food. Literally ran out of food. And had no money. Nathan was 14 months old. 14 months old, I think it was, when we went to college. Caleb was born the second year. I got a newborn baby, and I don't have a job anymore. The job dried up. You know why? You know, I didn't learn one thing. Honest to, I can speak here. Honest to the Lord. I never learned one thing about my Bible in Bible college. I didn't learn the ministry there. I learned the ministry through heartache. <laughs> Trials, temptations, burdens, lack, suffering. I don't think I've ever suffered anything, to be honest. I'm still overweight, trying to lose a few pounds. Boy, that was a rabbit trail. Look at 15. I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent, ye may believe, nevertheless, let us go on unto him. This funeral that Jesus Christ went to, John chapter 11, the reason that he stayed those two days, and and you get down to 38 and 39, by this time he stinketh, uh, he's being told by Martha, for he hath been dead four days. So he's been dead four days, and Jesus hasn't resurrected him yet. Why did Jesus Christ let all that happen? Why does Jesus Christ let young people, why does does he let people die? Why why does he let cancer? Why, why, Why all the heartache? 
I'm getting tired of the heartache. I just, I'll be honest with you, I'm a glass house. I don't hide things very well. I get, it's written all over my face. I'm tired of the heartache. I want to go home. Amen. I want to go to a place where I've read about him for 50 plus years, where there's no, there's no heartache and there's no sorrow, and there's no pain, and there's no more saying goodbye. I'm tired of saying goodbye. Amen. But why does God let all that happen? He wants to strengthen. He wants to make me believe that God is real. If you look at uh, 6, he, was, he abode two days still in 15. We just read it. It was for the intention that Jesus Christ wanted them to believe. That, that's what it says, folks. He said he was glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent you may believe. He was going to resurrect Lazarus. 39, we already read it. He had been dead four days. Genesis 1:20. Life appears, the word life appears on the fifth day, and he was going to resurrect him on the fifth day. If you look at 1140, Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Let me just back up. Let me pause right here. I don't know if we all get this, but it's important what you believe. It's absolutely important what you believe. We've often taught you, if you can accept the first ten words of your Bible, about the creation of heaven and earth, first ten words, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Those first ten words, if you can come to grips with that, because the majority of the world has not come to grips with that. If you can come to grips with those first ten words, you're pretty much on a good path to believing everything else in your Bible. Every once in a while, Pastor Mike and a few of us get together and we just kind of brainstorm and think things up. And, and you know what? My Bible tells me that Jesus Christ is coming again. You want to know something? That's kind of hard to believe without a Bible. Without knowing, without knowing that you can... You can <laughs> The, the, all this Bible right here, about this much has been already happened over here. We're about ready to clock out, folks. We're about ready to, to enter into his presence physically. I, enter into his, I entered into his presence this morning again, got up at 6 o'clock, got my coffee and my little whatever I ate, little, little health food bar. I'm on a health food kick now. I had to give up peanut butter. So if I, if I start shaking, it's because I haven't had peanut butter for 30 days. I'm like a chain, I eat, I eat food like a chain smoker. And all of a sudden, the buttons on my suit went, you got to lose some weight, Pat. I forget where I was, that's okay. John chapter 11. Oh. Something's hard to believe. The coming of the Lord without your Bible? Talk about the coming of the Lord to, to some stranger. I would dare say, I'm going to point fingers. I would dare say that some of us are in here. We, we read it, but we don't believe it. We don't believe that in a very short period of time we're clocking out. And if you're not saved and come to church that Sunday morning, you're going to be in an empty house. So you better get saved this morning. You better come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because according to that book, he's coming. Go to John. I flipped some pages here. If thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Look at 41 and 42. I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which standeth by, I said it, Jesus says, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. 43 now. And 44. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And you've often heard teachers and preachers or whoever, if he hadn't named Lazarus, the whole cemetery would have emptied out. But he named Lazarus. And do you realize today, if you're born again here this morning, I don't know how this is going to happen, but he's going to say, Michael, 
Margaret, Paul, Pat, Debbie, Ed, Kathy. He's going to go, John, he's going, your name. You're going to hear your name. I don't know how God can do that. But when he brought Lazarus from the grave, he called him by name. He didn't have to do that. You know, God knows your name this morning. Do you know in the book of Isaiah, do you know he surnamed you? You know what your surname is? My first name's Pat. I don't like it, but it is. My surname is Dean. That's your surname. We often talk about Peter. No, his first name was Simon. His last name was Peter. That was his surname. You read your book of, the book of Isaiah, you know what God did? God chose your surname. I don't know how he did that. There's a lot of things I have to shake my head and I, I don't know how he did that. I don't know how he did that. 42, 43, 44. And when he had thus spoken, he said, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And here's where I want to be. I want to talk about grave clothes this morning. Grave clothes. 44 says this. You say, what's a church supposed to be like? What's a church supposed to be doing? Well, let me read verse 44. And he that was dead came forth. Now he's bound. Hand, they, 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 they used to wrap their whole bodies. We know this. He's bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus, now Jesus Christ is going to resurrect him. But you know who he told to take off his grave clothes? Those believers around him. Loose him and let him go. You know what church is really about? Okay, one man plants, another man waters. God does the saving. You've never won anybody to Jesus Christ in your life, so don't say you have. Okay, you simply gave him the truth and God did the work behind scene. You couldn't see what the Spirit of God was doing in that person's life. Had that person ready, put them through a, a litany of circumstances to bring them. That's God. So God does the saving. God does the born againing. But you know who takes the grave clothes off? Now, I'm not taking any of the way from the power of Jesus Christ. But in that verse, Jesus Christ looked at all those people around him that were believers and said, loose him and let him go. He was bound hand. He was bound foot. He was bound face. Your hand is your work. It's how you work. Your foot is your walk. Your face is your witness. Your hand is your, your work. Your foot is your walk. And your face is your witness. But he told, he said, loose him and let him go. As I have looked at John 11, You've got several times that Lazarus in chapter 12 also, that Lazarus is spoken of. There are four garments of grave clothes as I've tried to put this thing logically in my mind. As I've read 11 and part of 12, or not all of 12, four garments of grave clothes that must be removed. That first garment of grave clothes is unbelief. The world is drowning in unbelief. What really separates us from anybody else? Well, we believe. I think somewhere on our sign it says believers meeting in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what really separates us. We're believers. Okay, we, there are the, you've got a King James Bible, you've got hymns. I got all that. But what's the rudimentary thing? What did God want removed in Lazarus? As you continue to read, and we will. Because sometimes people in that storyline, they didn't believe, and they ended up believing. It's important what you believe today. You know what's going to get you into heaven? Believing that Jesus said you could come in. 
the prodigal son, no, not prodigal son, that, uh, that thief on the cross. I've, I've said this to you. A pastor in, in uh, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, there was a little segment of a, a message that he made. Alistair Begg. And the thief on the cross gets up to the pearly gates and, and one of the angels meets him and asks him, well, tell me, about the, tell me about redemption and tell me about salvation and tell me about sanctification and tell me about all these great doctrines. Now, he's been a thief who just died on the cross, his cross. But he addressed Jesus Christ and said, remember me when thou comest into thy, thy, thy kingdom. And Jesus looked at him and said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So the thief looks at that angel, that managerial angel. It's all hypothetical. What, what right do you have to be in heaven? The man on the middle cross said I could come. It's important what you believe today. Because 99 and 9 tenths percent of the world does not believe this Bible. Most Christians don't believe this Bible. You may be here and not believe what you're reading. It's important that you keep coming. It's important that you, because faith comes by hearing. You know why church is so important? Now, I've been at this for 50 plus years. Church isn't part of my life. Church is my life. I come here because I want to hear this Bible preached. Amen. I want to sing old hymns that redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till. I want to hear those old hymns. I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear something that says absolutely squat. Amen. I, don't, I don't need contemporary music to move my hips. I couldn't dance when I was lost and could dance. <laughs> Ask my wife. She could dance. Not me. I was a football player. What the, what the, what, 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 what yes. <laughs> Kevin, I, I'm going to just put my, go out on a limb. You couldn't dance, you couldn't dance either, brother. <laughs> I've never met a football player that could dance. We're either hitting somebody or getting hit down or knocked down or, but, Unbelief. I've got to believe this book. Even with things, even when he, Jesus Christ, was absent two days and waited another two days, four days. And Martha looked at him and said, Jesus, he smells. He's stinky. And that meant absolutely nothing to God. Because God was doing something. All I can tell you that whatever heartache you're going through, we've buried our loved ones. Got a grandson that still has repercussions from cancer. Had a, I've got a daughter-in-law that went through major cancer, breast cancer, both uh, mastec uh, double mastectomy, all the chemos and all the therapies and everything. But you know what God wanted us? Been without money sometimes. Didn't know where the food was coming from. And I'm nobody. In the book of Ephesians, when Paul says, I'm less than the least of all the saints, that's Pat Dean. But after 50 plus years, you want to know something? God says, you need to trust me. You need to trust me. You remember when I, when, I, when I saved you there? And you remember when I saved you there? You remember, you remember when I brought you back from North Carolina? My, your pastor said, would you just think about coming back and helping me? I don't know how much I helped my beloved pastor. I don't know why he would ask me to come back. But all I know is this. If you'll trust God, he will order your steps. He will, he will make you a plain path. That's what he's promised in his word. He will order your steps. And you know, you, don't, you, want, you want to know really what he wants from us? 
All he wants is us to believe him. Just believe him. And if you learn to believe him, you'll learn to love him. (laughs) Because he's the most lovable person in the entire creation. But he, he wants you to believe. If you went into, uh, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ in Luke uh, chapter 24 and verse 11, the women came and were telling the rest of the, the men disciples. And, and it, says that, uh, it says in uh, 24, 11 of Luke, uh, as they spoke, as the women spoke, it was like idle words. I hope, I hope we're not using idle words today. I just want to show you one thing. Go, go to, go to First uh, Timothy with me. Go to First Timothy, chapter four. Because maybe you're here today, and you'll say, I, "I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe Jesus Christ existed. He's just a myth. He's a he's a fairy tale. He did. You guys always make this stuff up." Go to First Timothy, chapter four, and look at verse ten. Christianity, I mean, that, that's, there's nothing new about that. You go online or whatever social media you use, and somebody's telling you that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ didn't exist. You know, you have to remove a lot of people in history to remove Jesus Christ. <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what do you do with the entire, what do you do with the rest of the storyline? You just can't say, well, I, Jesus Christ doesn't exist, and you pick him out. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. Now, he's talking about the latter times. But if you get down to verse number 10, it says, For therefore, and I know the therefore, but let's just take the verse, let it say what it says. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. See, to me, he's special. <laughs> Extremely special. <laughs> but let's just say you don't believe that Jesus Christ is, you, you've never trusted him as your Savior, or you don't even care. You know, he's still the Savior of all men. Amen. That's a self evident truth. That's a rudimentary thought that you just can't get away from. Whether you have trusted him or not, whether you like it, whether you think he's a myth or not, that verse tells me. Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men. But we'll all believe. No, you didn't. didn't. There's no period there. Especially of those that believe. Look at at, uh, John chapter 12. Look at John chapter 12. Because I'm going to give you, Lord willing, we're going to look at these four four things. And then then I want to look at some reasons why why many Christians fight the removal of of their grave clothes. By the way, do you know that the body in that casket is not Christian Patterson? That's his grave clothes. By his own testimony, he's in heaven with Jesus Christ. So as I'm looking at all you pretty people out there, Handsome, clean, some of you wearing church clothes, some of you wearing clothes like when you go to the beach. (laughs) What I'm seeing and what you're seeing right now is grave clothes. You've never seen the real Pat Dean in your life. In heaven you will. I bet you he's not going to have any spots all over his body because he's getting to be an old man. Doesn't have any heart disease anymore. Doesn't need these stupid glasses to read. So that thing that we spend so much time on, and we primp it, and we poke it, and we pluck it, and we're proud of it. And I'm glad you showered. I did too. I showered, shaved, Put cologne on under my arms. Tried to make myself presentable. 
God says, well, I'm glad you don't stink this morning just humanly. But how's your soul? Maybe God thinks you stink spiritually. Just maybe. I don't know. But this thing we spend so much time on is grave clothes. Look at chapter 12. So the first garment of grave clothes that must be removed is unbelief. Unbelief. You've got to come to a position in your life where you say, I don't care what I hear on the internet or on TV. This book is, this book is true. Amen. This book saved me. Amen. This book keeps me. Amen. This book is trustworthy. Amen. This book helps me to be more faithful like Jesus Christ. And when I have one day that I go without this book, I get cranky. Amen. Give it two days and I get crankier. Give it a week, and I'm hell on wheels. See, some of you are just wonderful. Pat Dean's not wonderful. Without this book, I'm hell on wheels, boy. So when somebody tells me this book is a myth, they don't know what we've gone through. And this book was our life. My lifeline to God. Look at John chapter 12. Here's another thing. Here's, an, here's the next time you see uh, Lazarus. One says, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Whose table are you sitting at? You know one of the garments, another one of the garments, the first one was unbelief. you got to change where you're dining. <laughs> We've all got our favorite little place. I couldn't, I couldn't believe uh, Brother Spurgeon. He liked going to Page Diner. Uh, I'm sorry, but when he said that, Michael and I looked at each other and said, what? He said, no, they got a good, you know, he, okay, you like it, brother. It's just a diner, brother. And I got nothing against Page Diner. I've eaten there and we'll continue to eat there. But we've all got our favorite eatery. But you know what I had to do when I came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Because some people were helping to take the grave clothes off, to, off of me. I had to change where I was dining. You know what this is about this morning? I'm glad you're here. When Jesus in the latter part of John said, come and dine to his, his disciples, his, the, come and dine. You've got to find a new place to eat. And I'm going to flat out say it, and I don't care what you think of me. You've got to get off of YouTube and the Internet because that's the worst place to dine. You're going to get food poisoning. I don't care whether you believe me or not. I really don't. You know where God, what God designed for the eatery? The local church. I understand job schedules because I, I used to work in a job for a living. I got all that. I understand health. We always can't be here. I understand taking vacations in a few weeks. I'm going to go down, Lord willing, to North Carolina and see my, 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 my boys, their wives, my grand our grandchildren, and two of our great-grandbabies. I'm going to have a wonderful time, God willing. You know what God ordained to be the table that you eat at? Right here. Right here. Called First Bible Church. Say, you just wanted to put butts in the seat. Yeah, probably. That, yeah, that, there may be some truth to that. Because at least you're here. You know, when you sit at, in, in your house, cozied up on the couch with your coffee and your Danish, and you got your pajamas still on. I had to do that when I had my heart repaired. I had a whole month, man. I couldn't, I couldn't move. 
I listen to it on the, on the YouTube, the stupid tube. But I can guarantee you it's not the same. It's just not the same. There's something when I can look across and say, Brother Paul, give me a handshake, brother. Love you, man. I can't do that with YouTube. How does iron sharpen iron when my iron is sitting at home and your iron is sitting here? How does that work? It doesn't work. Now you're, now you're the choir this morning. I haven't seen some of our, we don't have church members. I haven't seen some of our people for months. They just don't come anymore. And you know what? I'm not mad. I'm not mad. I'm sad. I love this. I, we've said this. This is like a family reunion to me every Sunday. It's a smaller one on Wednesdays, but it's still. But on Sunday, my word, this is like a family reunion. Amen. He's sitting at the same table. You look up. Just go to Psalm 69.22. Go to Psalm 69.22. Job Psalms. Do you know the world has a table? My Bible tells me it does. Psalm 69. Just looking at verse number 22. But if you went back in Psalm 69, look at verse 21. They gave me also gall for my meat. That's the crucifixion. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Folks, that's the crucifixion multiplied hundreds of years prior to it actually happening. How do you explain that? Well, you know, men just wrote that book. Yeah, they did. They were holy men, moved by the Holy Spirit of God. No doubt. But look at 22. Those who gave him that gall and that vinegar, the Jews, or excuse me, the Romans may have done it, but it was the nation of Israel that didn't want their Messiah. They did not want a suffering Messiah. They wanted a reigning king. Well, they're going to get a reigning king, but just not yet. But look at 22. Let their table become a snare. Their table. It was the wrong table. They had assimilated them. Those Jews, that nation of Israel, they, all, they, they were permitted to have their, their temple and, and their religious things. But they had assimilated themselves into the Roman Empire. They were the nation who said, we have no king but Caesar. Let their, let their table become a snare before them, and that which have, have been for their welfare let, welfare, let it become a trap. You know, the world's got a table. Whose table are you eating at? I'm glad you're here today. Glory to God, I really am. What table are, when you leave here and, and go to your home on Monday, what table are you eating at? Because the world's got a table. The very next thing after the resurrection of Lazarus, we find him at the table with Jesus Christ. Go, to, go back to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And look at verses 9 through 11. Four garments, grave clothes that must be removed. Well, you've got to start believing. You've got, to, you've got to believe what the Bible says. You've got to change where you eat. We've all got... When I was lost as a teenager, I won't even tell you where I ate. It wasn't in the Bible and it wasn't church. I can tell you that flat out. I even went to church. Probably never missed a Sunday. A lot like what Pastor Mike talks about. I had a great church. Some of you know, some, some of you have actually been there. Very large church. I wasn't saved as a teenager. Boy, I sat at every evil table I could sit at. <laughs> but once I came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, it's called the new birth. You know what God impressed me with? You need to change tables, boy. 
Get yourself in where the Bible is taught and preached and God's people love God and Jesus Christ and they can help, they can help take your grave, grave clothes off. So I started going to church willingly. Prior to that, I didn't go willingly. I just went. Look at chapter 12. Another, another garment. Look at chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he, he was there. And they came not, now watch this. And they, talking about Lazarus, they, they came not, also of Christ, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to death, also to, put Lazarus also to death. Comment just right there. You hang out with Jesus, the world's not going to like you very well. You just have to accept that. Don't be, don't, don't be afraid. Don't be chicken little. If you're going to hang out with Jesus Christ, hang out with God's people, no, there's a price to pay. The world's not going to like you. You open your mouth one time about knowing Jesus Christ as Savior, you just put a target on your back. You might as well just hang the target around your neck. That's just the way it is. And I'm going to get to this, God willing. You know what? This is why some Christians fight the removal of their grave clothes. I'll get to this. Look at verse 11. Because by that, by reason of him. Who's that talking? Reason of him is Lazarus. Many of the Jews went away and, belie and believed on Jesus. You know what I see right there? One of the grave clothes is, I have to have my own reputation. I have to make my mark in life. But you know what God gave him? God, God removed his reputation and gave him a testimony. We've often said this. You know what a reputation is? It's what people think of you. You know what a testimony is? What people think of God through your life. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a pastor, deacon. You don't have, all you have to do is live like a Christian. Live. Here's another one, and then we'll move on. Look at 12, chapter 12, John 17 through 19. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out. You notice he's always going back and referring to Lazarus. He's referring to a man that got resurrected from the dead. Do you know what the new birth is? The Bible says in Ephesians 2, I think the chapter, that we were dead in trespasses and sins. You know what the new birth is? It's a resurrection. It's a resurrection. He keeps referring to somebody, this Lazarus, who has been resurrected. The people therefore in 17 that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. Bear record to what? That they had seen a resurrected Lazarus. They're not talking about Jesus Christ here. They're talking about Lazarus. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. 19, the Pharisees therefore said unto them themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. You know what I see there? In this short storyline between chapter 11 and maybe even, not even half of chapter 12, I see a continuation, a cause. There was something different about Lazarus. He had become consistent. We're going to talk about that word. One of the problems with Christianity today in America is Christians are inconsistent. Man, when we're on, we're on. And when we're off, we're off. And Christianity to many of God's people is this. It's a roller coaster. I hate roller coasters. Yeah, somebody, I hear an amen coming from 
Mike Rubino. I like fast cars. I still like them. Never was on a motorcycle only one time, and it scared the devil out of me. Almost. Give me a fast car today with a thousand horsepower. One of those fast dodges. Whew. Racing gears in the rear end. 12 inch Mickey Thompson tires. Four speed. Where I can go as fast as I want to. From A to B. To me that's glory. But you know how some Christians live? They're, they're like on a roller coaster. Well Monday they were up here. Oh God help me for Tuesday. Because Tuesday. Whoom. The car came down and you're as low as you can be. Then God shows himself strong again. Vroom! The car goes back up on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, vroom! You know, Christianity is not supposed to be that way. Christianity is a consistent walk. Doesn't happen overnight. But you got to have a desire. you got to have a want to. A want to. To say, you want to know something? I've got to work a job. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a whatever in my trade. I've got to pay bills. I've got a mortgage. I got all that stuff. But in the morning, you've got to determine in your heart, I want to know more about Jesus Christ today. Lord, show me something Amen. so that my life isn't this roller coaster. Because some of us in this place are on a roller coaster. We're not walking. A. B, and you know why your Christianity isn't working? Because you're not believing what you read. You know he's already given you the victory. Amen. There's no reason to be discouraged or depressed. Amen. You say, Pat, if you, hey, I have been discouraged. I have been depressed. I've been all those D words that I come up with. But you know what straightens me out every time? God starts speaking to me. I get my heart right. I get my eyes, I start believing. I get my eyes off of everything around me, the problems. I stop putting Goliath between me and God. I, 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 I take Goliath and put him over there and put God between me and Goliath. That's what David did. Consistent for this cause. The resurrected life of Lazarus is still being connected to, the, to Jesus Christ. That This was his triumphal uh, entry. If you, i got a heading in my Bible. Lazarus is consistent. He's constant. There's not much written about him, but in that short period of time, I saw, I saw four things. Now, let's look at this. Reasons. What, why are there reasons? What are the reasons? There's got to be reasons why some Christians fight the removal of their grave clothes. Some Christians just refuse to take the grave clothes off. When they're on, they're on. And when they're not, they're not. And I'm not always talking about the attendance of church. Hey, there's, there's work, there's health, I got all that. But when I don't have to work and my health permits me, you know where I go? And this is, these comments are not self-serving. This place keeps me alive. Let me point my bony finger. My wife says you've got to stop pointing your bony finger at people. No, it's a good marker. I like pointing my bony finger at people. I haven't seen some of the people I love that I've known for years. I haven't seen them for six months. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Does it make me mad? No. It breaks my heart. And you reach out to some people, and sometimes things get turned around. And, and <coughs> Reasons, wife. Some Christians fight the removal of their grave clothes. Here's the, here's the, these things, there's only a few. Yes, you need to answer, press, President Biden, glory to God. 
Uh, I have a, what is it called, Pastor Mike, a meme? Meme. Huh? By breakfast, yes. Yes, donuts. No, I can't eat donuts anymore. It's funny. I was pushing the wrong buttons on our telegram, and I, I canceled myself several times, and Mike wondered. My, Bobby said, Bobby comes up to me, and you know, I'm, I'm watering some flowers or something, and Bobby comes up to me, and he says, Pastor, why do you keep canceling yourself on, on Telegram. I said, what, what are you talking about? I, I don't, what, he says, I, I was pushing the wrong buttons. So Michael, he puts me back, Pastor Mike puts me back on, but he sends, he's got this, this meme and a guy, guy's phone is laying on his desk and he's got a hammer and he's crash, cr that's me, that's me. I still have it, I'll keep it forever, brother. Hey, you never know when President Biden, Biden wants to talk to you. Go on. Looking back, one of the reasons, go to, go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Now, I'm gonna, I'm, I wrote something in, my, in the column of my notes because I felt, Pat, you need to say this to our people. No, not, these are not, now listen to me, these are not comments of condemnation. But rather, these are comments of consideration and possibly needful correction. Because I'm gonna, we're gonna go through some things. Looking back, you keep looking back, you're gonna get in trouble. Remember Lot's wife? I mean, go back, we won't go there. But if you went back, I wrote the uh, Genesis 19, 26, says, but his wife looked back. What happened when she looked back? Became a pillar of salt. She was happy in that old world. This world has become so tasteless to me that it actually grieves me. Hey, I love you. I love our church. I love the ministry. I'm not, I'm not negative about anything. I, I you know. But the way this world this present evil world. I know some of you just, uh, you're adored with, oh, I get this, I get that. You need to get unloved by the world. Look at Luke chapter 9. Because that's, these are why your Christianity, this is why your Christianity is not working. Because you refuse to take off the grave clothes. You refuse to come with other believers. Oh, and I'm glad you're here. Please come back. But our goal here, we have an agenda. The, the, the edification, addicted to the ministry of the saints, last chapter of 1 Corinthians. What are we addicted to? We're addicted to helping you take your grave clothes off. And you know why? Because somebody helped me take my grave clothes off. Now, they didn't all come off in one day. <laughs> but as I stand here today, I can honestly tell you they came off. They came off. Looking in the wrong direction, look at Luke chapter 9, verse 57. 57, and I'll read 57 through 62. I have a heading in my Bible. It says, another test. Of, <laughs> I love it. I love it when somebody says that. Another test, as if this wasn't the first test. Another test of discipleship. Because you see, not every believer is a disciple. A disciple, you got to take the next step. Look at Luke 9, 57. Came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, now watch this, because there's about three times here people are going to say, Lord. That's a real dangerous word. Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Ooh, what a statement. Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not 
where to lay his head. Better you follow the foxes, better you follow the birds, because if you follow me, you may not have anywhere to lay your head. 59. And he said unto another, and, and yeah, he said unto another, follow me. This time he's telling somebody to follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Again, priorities. Does God not want you to bury your father? No, that's not what he's saying. He's talking about the, the priority of discipleship. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury the dead. So much for being politically correct. Let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Notice it wasn't the kingdom of heaven at this point in Luke. It's the kingdom of God. That's righteousness and joy and peace. It doesn't come with observation. The kingdom of God is within you. New birth, 61. And another also said, Lord. Notice he keeps saying Lord. But none of them are really following him. I will follow thee, but... Mel used to say, get your butt out of the way. But... Let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus, now watch this. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Don't get mad at Pat Dean or Mike Veach. We simply read and teach the Bible. Okay. Here's what, I'm not a farmer. You know when you're right, you, you, I've done it, you've done it. You're going down the highway. You're looking at everything around you. You've got, you got the car in the lane. But there's something over here. Maybe it's a wreck. It's to your left. So you're going. You're in your, you're in your lane. You look at this guy. As you're going, you have to kind of do this. Do you know where your car's going? Your car's going where you were looking. This new birth here, this kingdom of God, he likened unto having, uh, having put his hand to the plow. Looking back. How about, go to 2 Peter with me. How about, here's another one. Now I'm having fun, so don't go too silent on me because I'm having a good time. And when you guys don't get too quiet, when you, when you get too quiet... I figure you're either tired of me, mad at me, or, and, or I'm getting ready to duck because you're going to throw something at me. So, uh, but I'm having a good time. See, this, uh, this, is, this, is, this is not for you. This is for Pat Dean. See, I take, I take my Bible personally. When God says to me, you put your hand to the plow. Fifty plus years ago, you put your hand to the plow. If you keep looking back, or if you get your eyes off of me, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. <laughs> he didn't say that to Paul. He said that to Pat. See, I take this whole thing personally. Don't we always say Christianity is a relationship? Well, that relationship I've had with that woman since 1968, we were seniors in high school, I take it pretty seriously. Now, I might have ebbed and flowed, and that was my fault at times. But I, after all these years, now we're 72 years old, and, and I can only speak for my, I never speak for my wife because she may disagree with me all over. I take my marriage a little seriously. I take being in church a little serious. I tend to read my Bible a little seriously. So when God says I'm not worth shooting, Amen. then I take it seriously that he means, Pat Dean, you're not worth shooting. Amen. Amen. You take it seriously. Amen. You take it personally. That we always say. You see, this isn't religion. you got to take it personally. And I said these aren't comments of condemnation. These are comments of consideration. Maybe I need to change things. God knows I do. I wake up every morning and say, what do, you, what do I need to change today, Lord? 
I mean, I've been at it for 50 plus years, but I, I'm, sure, I'm certain I need to change something. Amen. Sometimes, I, I fear sometimes even in our good little local church, some of God's people here, we don't, we don't our Christianity is not real to us. We're just going through motions with a King James Bible. <laughs> All right, enough of that nonsense. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 8. Here's another reason why Christians fight the removal of their grave clothes. Firstly, they're looking back. They're looking in the wrong direction. Here's another one. They're still happy to live in two worlds. Two worlds. You're still fascinated with this present evil world. I can only say it personally. There ain't, a, there ain't a blasted thing in this present evil world that fascinates me. Amen. Nothing. Nothing. I thought I was going to get to go home about three years ago when I took my first heart attack, then the second heart attack, then the third heart attack, and then oh, a quadruple bypass. And you know what? Every time, every time it happened, I thought, oh, God, thank you. Thank you. Maybe this is the time. And then God says, no, I'm not done with it yet. I know some of you are not there. Some of you don't think that way. I got that. That's okay. But some of us are still living in two worlds. Look at 2 Peter 2.8. Now, I talked about Lot. If anybody should not be in heaven, it's Lot. But according to here, he's in heaven. We're going to get to meet Lot. How about Samson? We're gonna, Samson's in heaven, Hebrews 11. But you know why you're not growing? Because the stinky grave clothes are still hanging on to some of us. Living in two worlds. Look at 8, 2 8, 2 Peter. Let me just back it up to read 7. And deliver just Lot, just Lot. That's got to be a, uh, a, a type mistake. That's got to be a mistake, Father. Why would he say just Lot? J-U-S-T. Just as if I'd never sinned. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Parenthetical thought now. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The reason why some Christians refuse to take off their grave clothes is because they're happy to live in two worlds. Save people. They love to go to church. They may even read their Bible. But there's something in this world that fascinates them. They're just fascinated by it, man. Something just came to mind. Stay where you're at. Stay, I'll, maybe I'll find it. Maybe I won't. Maybe I won't. Oh, I found it. Whatever a man depends upon, whatever rules his mind, whatever governs his affections, whatever is the chief object of his delight, that is his God. Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Here's another one. Go to John 6. John 6. Do you know why some people, some Christians, fight the removal of their grave clothes? Well, firstly, they're looking in the wrong direction. They're, they're looking back. Luke wrote in, in 9, said chapter 9, when a man put his hand to the plow and looked back, he's not looking back. He's not fit for the kingdom of God. Another one was a, a, a lot, and there's Hosea chapter 7, Ephraim, another name for Israel. Ephraim, Ephraim hath mixed himself among the people. You know what Israel's problem in the Old Testament was? Many, many problems. But one, of, one of the rudimentary problems, they had assimilated themselves into every culture that they were around. 
Ezra and Nehemiah, if you go back to Ezra, they come out of captivity. They're now rebuilding the city and they're rebuilding the walls. 49,000, I think it was 692 or 97, came out of the captivity. There were many, many, many more that had gone into the captivity. It was a 70-year captivity, so even some people had died. But you know, I mean, all you got to do is do the math, early part of Ezra. Only less than 50,000 Jews, Hebrews, came out of that captivity and wanted to start afresh. I've often told you I hate God's math. He heals ten lepers. One turns around and says, praise the Lord, thank you. And Jesus in the next says, where are the nine? <clears throat> Once again, not comments of condemnation. I like to be reproved. It makes me think. Okay. I'm constantly trying to evaluate myself. Okay. Do I, am, do I really have the right heart attitude in this thing? Okay. Am I just doing this because I've been doing this? I mean, 46 years, Deb and I planted our, our flag here 46 years ago. Okay, I, a lot can happen in 46 years. It's just, uh, but am I, do I still have, I'm, I'm all, when I wake up and I say, Lord, if I don't have the right heart attitude, you stop me. Amen. You, you force me, Lord, to have the right heart. I don't care how you do it. You force me to have the right heart attitude. I'm constantly I was taught that as a child. I was taught that in athletics. Once I came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, it was like, I, it was the same thing. It's like, don't worry about that guy. Worry about yourself. <laughs> Here's another one. Not totally convinced. Go to John chapter 6. All right, this is the, this is the chapter, the feeding of the 5,000. And uh, Jesus Christ has given them some really strong doctrine from about uh, verse 53 down to 59. Uh, drink my blood, eat my flesh. Roman Catholicism, I'm, I'm in John chapter 6. Uh, Roman Catholicism picks up on that. And, uh, okay, now you got transubstantiation. And uh, they don't continue to read where it says, uh, uh, verse 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there were some in verse 66, and we always talk about John 6, verse 66, 666. Verse 66, from that time, many of the disciples went back and walked no more with him. Now you get where my point is. Because somebody wasn't totally convinced. But what you read here, you would say, if you don't read any more, what you would say is, let's read it. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, I've learned something about life. Don't be so ready to talk. Don't be so ready. Oh, I know the answer. I've got a verse. Let thy words be few. Because what I read here, I'm going to walk away and say, let's read it. Then Simon Peter answered him in 68, To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. Now watch what he says in 69. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Have not I chosen, Jesus answered him, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is the devil? He speaks of Judas Iscariot. But I want you to go back to 69 and underline or highlight. I have an underline in my Bible where it says, and are sure. Now go to John 13. And this is not comment, this is not, these are not comments of condemnation on Peter. This is comments of condemnation on me. But I have an illustration in the Bible. Guess what? Reasons why Christians fight the removal of their grave clothes? Some, some of us are looking back. The car's going to go into the ditch. You keep looking back. I grew up in a generation where they used to say, burn the bridges. Burn the bridges. 
You know what the world tells me? Now listen to me. Some of you young people are not, some of you young couples are not going to agree with this. The world tells me I need to diversify my finances. I need to diversify my life. I was taught as a teenager, don't put your eggs all in one basket. Then I got saved. Started reading my Bible. You know what God said to me? Pat, put all your eggs in one basket. If I was big enough to save you, I am big enough to keep you. And what's the worst that can happen to me? I die? That's the goal, beloved. That am the goal. I get rid of this old wretched man that I am. And I'm standing absolutely perfect in the presence of Jesus Christ. That's my goal in life. But the world says, don't you put all your eggs in one basket. And I read my Bible and Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, wait a minute, there's got to be another way. Oprah says there's another way. <laughs> yeah. Some of you trust Oprah more than you trust your Bible. Ah. That's poking the bear. Where we got you? Oh, John 13. John 13. Look at 36 through 38. Now remember, John chapter 6. And I understand growth. But when somebody says, I'm sure, you need to continue to read because they weren't always sure. I, you know, I wrote something in my notes. You're sure, and I put it all in capital letters, will always be tested. I'm sure. Well, you got to watch because a test is coming just to see how sure you are. And I am. John 13. You see, you don't understand. You don't, you don't understand my hardwiring. This is absolutely fun to me. Getting my skin peeled off my back Amen. by my pastor and others. And every once, once in a while, God says, okay, you're going to peel your own skin off this morning. Amen. To me, it's fun. But I don't want to stand at that judgment seat of Christ naked. Amen. I got a whole bunch of things to answer for. I know it. Go to John 13. Not totally convinced. Look at 36 through 38. Jesus knew he wasn't totally convinced. 36 through 38, Simon Peter said unto, the Lord, uh, unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, whither I go, thou cannot, canst not come uh, uh, follow uh, me now, excuse me, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Now watch Peter again. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Sound like they were sure. Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Jesus knew he wasn't sure. He thought he was sure. You know why you don't believe your Bible? You're not really sure. It takes time. You know, there's about 30 years between the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ, 25, 30 years and Peter writing first and second Peter, by the time he writes 30, 25, 30 years later, first and second Peter, he's sure. Go to, stay with me, go to John 18. We know this storyline. And once again, we're not condemning, we're not condemning Peter. I'm trying to get a principle. Why do some Christians Fight the removal of their grave, grave clothes. They're just, firstly, they're looking back. Secondly, they're living in two worlds. Thirdly, they're just not totally convinced. Look at John 18.10. Uh, uh, Peter, at this point, is fighting the wrong battle. He's in the wrong kingdom. All right. And we get, get around uh, 18.10. 
And uh, this, then said Simon Peter, uh, having a, a sword, uh, drew it, smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? He's, he, I mean, he's still wanting to defend Jesus. All right, now keep reading. Look at cha uh, verses, same chapter, look at 15 through 27. Now we get to where we all know the story. Simon Peter, Peter followed Jesus, 1815. So did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in unto Jesus in the place of the high priest. And Peter stood uh, at the door without. Then went out that uh, other disciple, that means it's John, obviously, which was known unto the high priest, spake unto her that, unto her that kept the door, brought in Peter, and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto, unto, uh, unto Peter, Art not thou also one of the man's disciples? He saith, I am not. Doesn't sound too sure to me. Now, once again, these are not comments of condemnation. But at that point in Peter's life, and we, 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 there's no sense in reading the rest, we know what he did. Verse number 25 says, And Peter stood and warmed himself. Firstly, he was at the wrong place. They said, therefore, unto him, Art not thou one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. Get down to around verse 27. Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. Was he sure? How sure are you? Now, that takes time. Again, we got a house full of new believers, relatively young believers. I've been at this 50 plus years. There are things that I see so plainly now that you won't see until you get 50 plus years. But you got to get convinced. And you know how you can get convinced? When you think you're sure, you're sure will always be tested. Those two years that I said we spent in Springfield, Missouri, supposedly going to college, I didn't go to college. It was a farce. My pastor said it the other day, it was a waste of money, a waste of my time. But God, God wanted to make sure that Pat and Debbie Dean knew how to trust him. Because there was going to be some road ahead of us. To this day, we go back there, and I'm telling the story. I mean, there wasn't one thing edible in that house. No food. I've got a, I've got a three-year-old, a two-year-old. I got a newborn baby boy, Caleb. And I can't, I got no money. I don't even have a nickel. Lord, what am I going to do? You know what we did? And if you think this is self-serving, you have it. You think what you want. Today, I'm sure. But it's been 50 plus years. And I went to school the next day. We had a word of prayer that morning. <laughs> Went to school, pled my heart out to God. I said, Lord, you could kill me. I pray you don't kill my wife. But I got two little innocent boys. You gave them to me. They don't deserve to go without food, Lord. Got up off of my hands and knees. Drove myself to school. Opened up my mailbox. Oh, there's a letter in my mailbox. Somebody wrote me a letter. It was from Mel Sabaka. Oh, Mel, maybe Mel's, he wants to just write me. I felt like I was a king. Mel Sabaka's writing me. I'm a nobody. And I open up that letter, and there's a check in there for $100. And a note that said, hey, Brother Pat, I don't know why, but God laid you on my heart. And I want to give you $100. That $100 was like a million dollars in 1971. You know the amazing thing about that? Debbie's, Debbie wondered, I, it just came to my mind. Debbie, you should have stopped me, honey. 
Do you know that check was sent four to five days before I ran out of food? It was in the mail before I ran out of food. We ran out of food. It's easy to say you're sure. But you're sure always comes with a test. God will say, I just... I want, to, I want you to know that you're just not sure enough yet. Now, if you think I'm pumping up Pat Dean, you come and apologize to me, and I'll, I'll forgive you. Because sometimes I wonder, Lord, why do you keep, why do you keep me, me? I'm an old man now. Why do you keep me here? Because I've lived long enough to know that God is real. And some of you teenagers, some of you young people, you need to know God. He's not a myth. He is my father. Oh, he's a good father. Sometimes he puts you through things. But he's always lifted me up through those times. And a lot of us know that in this place. So that heartache you're going through now, maybe it's designed so that you get sure of what you believe. Here's another one. I got to quit. Good night, Irene. I'll give you one more. I got a whole bunch of, I got, I got preconceived ideas. You're not teachable. I've got, you're unthankful. I've got sin itself. We'll, we'll forget that. Let me give you one more. Go to John 9. Go to John 9. You know why some people, some Christians, kind of fight the removal of their grave clothes? Because they're, they're, they're afraid, they have fear of what others think of them. <laughs> I found two times, multiple times, but I, I will boil it down to two. You're, you're afraid of what somebody thinks of you. So you hang on to... Being, uh, looking back and living in two worlds and, and you, 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 I mean, you're born again, you love, I'm not saying you don't love the Lord, uh, but you still got grave clothes, so you're a little stinky and, uh, and you're never really going to have the victory. Sometimes, I mean, over the years I've wondered, why don't I have the victory that that guy's had? And the Lord said, because you got too much dirt still hanging on you. You got to get clean, Pat. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you got a grave. You got a you got a, a piece of a grave clothes still stuck on your back. You need to make sure you get all the grave clothes off, Pat, because grave clothes stink. That's what Lazarus was stinky. We're trying to take the stinky off of us. Go to go to John chapter nine. Look at verse twenty-two. Now, you've got the man born blind here. He's a fascinating individual. They try to corner him. I love it. And you get around verse uh, 25 because they've said Jesus Christ is a sinner. And he answers and he says in 925, he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, once again, the Bible is so simple. I love it. But look down to verse 22 because he had parents. And the parents got cornered. And in 22, they said, he says, these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already. If I can just back up, look at verse 21. We'll look at verse 20. His parents also answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. 21. But by the, what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. Now 22. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Look at chapter 12. Closing with this one. Look at chapter 12. Look at 42 and 43. Going back to that extended storyline of Lazarus. Luke chapter 12. You've got a bunch of Pharisees uh, 
rulers, chief rulers, that they believe. Look at 42 and 43. Fear of what others think of us. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going gonna, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do everything I can do this day to uh, make the whole world mad at me. I don't do that. I hope you don't do that. But if you take a side with Jesus Christ, it's going to cost you. And it's easier if you just really, 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 as far as Jesus Christ is concerned, hedge your bets. Never open your mouth. Never live godly in front of your friends because you're afraid you're going to lose them. Let me give you a litmus test on Christianity. Your friends want you to go to the bar on Saturday night or some other activity. Instead of doing that, invite them to come to church on Sunday morning. I mean, you said that they were your friends, right? Now, let me tell you what. A real friend, he's going to come to church with you. He's probably lost as that goose in the snowstorm. But he's going to, nine times out of ten, he's going to, he's, or she's going to blow you off. Let me just throw this out. They're not really your friends. You need to come to grips with that. That's not being mean-spirited. That's, I'm a realist in life. You want me to go to the bar on Saturday night? How about you coming to church on Sunday morning? Now, I'm not saying go to the bar. But the litmus test is, you, you think they're your friends. Watch this. Last verse, 12. Look at 42 and 43. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. 43. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. <laughs> uh, is it that simple? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't say it was easy. You know, I've learned in life, anything that has any value with it comes with a dear price, a dear price. Things that I've gotten, had a conversation. I wear this, play, I, I lost my wedding band probably the first year I was married in a, uh, in a parking lot in the snow of Ohio. And all I heard that as I got off the shift in the steel mill, tink, 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 as I was taking the snow off my car. Never had a, never, never had a wedding band again. My dad had this ring. I don't even know how much it's worth. Probably worth nothing. But it's pretty to me. It's a black onyx. It is gold. I don't know what the gold or what. You know why I value this? It was my dad's. I could honestly tell you right now, you give me a million dollars for this ring, keep your million. This was my dad's. You know why I value Jesus Christ? Because the Father gave him to me, yet for your sakes. Yet for your sakes. All these things that God... You know what this is all about? Closing statement. We're just trying to get the grave clothes off of us. <laughs> it's not an easy job. And it doesn't happen in one day. But you gotta, you got to want to take the stinky grave clothes off. And you know who Jesus Christ told to do that? Oh, yes, he does it. I got all that. But he looked across and he saw another dear believer. And he said, John... Help Pat Dean take his grave clothes off. Loose him and let him go. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer.
you know not the Savior as your personal Savior, I go back to what 1 Timothy 4, what was it, 410 said, he's the Savior of the whole world, especially those that believe. Maybe you're here today and I really haven't, I didn't teach or preach to the lost. But somehow God can take his word that never returns void and give you what you need. Are you born again? Forget about taking the grave clothes off. You need, maybe you need to get resurrected. <laughs> you need to be born again. And we're not going to belabor this. We've been at it long enough. We're here for you. You want to sit down with an open Bible? There's multiple people, starting with me and Pastor, will sit down with an open Bible and show you what it means to be born again. Lazarus had to be brought back from the dead. But Christians, let's, let's get our grave clothes off. That's what Lazarus did. Somebody else loosed him and let him go. And the very next time we see his name, he's at the, he's at the table with Jesus Christ. To me, that's what church is. It's just a table. Jesus said, come and dine. I come here to dine every, every time I get my opportunity. By the grace of my God, I come here to dine. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your kindness even this morning. Thank you for giving me some clarity of mind and some direction in your word. Only God can give the increase. I'm aware of that. Thank you for God's people who want to have their grave clothes removed. So Father, help us in these last days before the trumpet sounds and we wing our way to the third heaven to get these stinky grave clothes off of us. And I will say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. You are dismissed.